I can show you the story of our political dysfunction in three graphs. Here they are. This first graph shows the degree to which the US Congress is polarized. And what that means technically is if you look at all the different Congresses back to the, the, around the Civil War era on the left, it starts at 1879. Um, to what extent can you predict every senator's vote, uh, that's in blue, or every House of Representatives, every representative's vote in red, to what extent can you predict their vote if all you know about them is where they are on the left-right spectrum? And if that's driving all the activity, then Congress is very polarized according to these political scientists. So what you see is that in the decades after the Civil War, uh, the US Congress was very, very polarized. We then have a period in the mid 20th century, that's the dip in the middle, where we have historically low levels of polarization. There's a lot of bipartisanship. If you know where someone is in the left right spectrum, that doesn't tell you exactly how they voted. There's a lot more going on. But then look what happens. Beginning in the 1980s in particular, the graphs rise up and up and up steadily. Now I stopped the graph there uh, in, in 2000 just as we reach the super high levels that we were at after the Civil War. I mean, it couldn't really get any higher, could it? I mean, we couldn't be worse than the decades after the Civil War, could we? But as you all know, the years since 2000 have been steadily up, up, up. Congress just gets more and more polarized. Now, those are the political elites. Political scientists are, uh, are in full agreement that our political elites have gotten very, very polarized. But some said, well, that's just the elites. You know, Americans are mostly a kind of a moderate, centrist kind of people. The people aren't polarized. And that was true until about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, but now it is no longer true. So this is data from the, uh, the Pew Foundation. When you, they do surveys of attitudes of Americans. And so you, they ask all kinds of attitude questions about environmentalism or gun control or abortion. And so if you just, on the bottom line, you see how far apart men and women are. You just take the absolute value of the difference between men and women on every item. How far apart are they? And the answer is not very far apart. We're not split on our attitudes by, by gender. And that hasn't changed. Low levels continuously from 1987 through 2012 when this data ends. Religion, also pretty low. Uh, if you look at income, education, and race, that's more, 10, 12% apart. But notice that they're not rising. So Americans are not coming apart on these demographic factors, except for one. The orange line is party. If you look at how far apart Republicans and Democrats are, even in the late 1990s, they were only about 10 to 12 points apart. And by 2012, they were 18 points apart. And I'll have to see if I can find more recent data. It's going to be even worse, much worse. And when Americans come apart by party, we then think differently about each other. And this, I think, is the most important graph for psychologists, affective polarization. How much do we dislike each other? So the American National Election Survey collects data on American voters uh, every other year. And they use what they call a feeling thermometer. So on a scale of zero is very cold, to 100 is very warm, you really like them. What do you think about the Supreme Court? Or about Italian Americans, or baseball, anything, they don't do baseball, but whatever. They, they ask about a lot of attitude objects. And what you find when they ask about what you think about the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, on the top lines you see in blue is what Democrats think about the Democratic Party, and the red is what Republicans think about the Republican Party. What you see is that they like their party. Now, I can't wait to get the newest data. I'm sure the Republicans are gonna dip quite a lot. But overall, Americans like their own party, and they dislike the other party. But note, the cross-party ratings, they're below 50, but not much. So in the 70s to the 90s, it dips from you know 47 down to 40. Uh, down to 40, okay? So it's dropping, but not much, and they're not that negative. Well, what happens in the Bush and Obama years? Nosedive. And that's actually data from Obama's first term. Again, when I get the data from after this election, it's gonna look much, much worse. So, um, uh, so this is what's happening to us. Now, um, why? Why are all these changes happening, and why are they intensifying in the last 15 years? That's the question. Uh, so I teamed up with a friend of mine, a political scientist, Sam Abrams, and we wrote an article in the uh, Washington Post last year listing what we think are the 10 top reasons. There's more, but these are the 10 clearest reasons why our politics have become so broken. Here are the reasons. I'm not going to go through them all, 
but I can actually summarize them in this way. These are all changes and trends that have interacted with our tribal nature. So think back, most of you took an intro psych course or a social psych course, most of you know about the famous uh, st summer camp study by Muzaffar Sharif. He took 11-year-old boys, brought them to a summer camp in Oklahoma. Uh, they spontaneously behaved sort of like Lord of the Flies. They did all this tribal stuff. And Sharif was able to ramp up their tribalism and violence, actually, by putting them into closer competition. And he was able to uh, end it by giving them superordinate goals. So you can manipulate tribalism based on external circumstances. And so here's the story. I'm going to oversimplify. But this, I think, is the main thread of modern American political history. Um, so in 1964, uh, President Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act, uh, a, a momentous moment, a major step forward for the United States. On that day, um, a young man who was working for him, uh, a young man named Bill Moyers, you may have heard of, uh, comes in to see the president and to congratulate him, Mr. President, what a great day, what a great victory, and the president is morose. Mr. President, what's wrong? And the president says to him, we've just turned the South over to the Republicans for the rest of my life and yours. So this is, and he was right, and this is what starts the shifting tectonic plates that give us a perfectly conservative party and a perfectly liberal party or progressive party. You can see it here. This is the electoral map from when Jimmy Carter won. Blue is the Democrats, uh, red is the Republicans, and those of you who are young might look at this and say, wait, didn't you get those colors backwards? Well, what's going on there? Uh, and this is the last time that the Democrat won the South. Uh, the Democratic Party was always a Southern and agrarian party. Note New England and the West Coast. They're Republican, as they had been for more than a century. So this is the electoral map, or uh, this is a version of it, as it used to be. But as those tectonic plates shifted, as conservative Southern Democrats left the Democratic Party, joined the Republican, that made the Republican Party more conservative and the Democratic Party more progressive. So we get a big split a right-left split, and it, it, it goes back and forth, but by the time we get to the 90s and then by George W. Bush's election, we have the now familiar map, very, very stable except for a few, you know, three to five swing states. Um, so this is what's happened. We now have all the, all the people on the left are in one party, all the people on the right are in another party. And once that happened, once we got party realignment and purified parties, then the voters all went into the appropriate party for them. And once the voters in each party were either all on the left or all on the right, that's step number two, um, then we get all these other effects interacting with our normal tribal psychology. Um, so Newt Gingrich comes in in 1995, institutes a number of changes to ramp up the partisanship. He doesn't want all the new Republican uh, freshman congressmen getting cozy, getting friendly with the Democrats, as they had a tradition of doing. So we get a much more partisan Congress. We get media fractionation. We get cable television in the 1980s so that now you can just watch confirmation, your, your uh, uh, politics all the time. And that's nothing compared to the internet in the 1990s. Uh, we get residential homogeneity. We get people moving. All the people on the left move into the cities. Not all, but uh, there's a general trend of progressives into the cities and conservatives into the outer suburbs and countryside, et cetera. So all these trends interact, the ones in red, all interact very directly with our partisan nature. This, I think, is what's happened to us. Uh, and notice when they all hit. In blue, look at the dates when these trends kind of matured, you might say, or happened. They're almost all in the 1990s. So we have this shift, this purification of the parties that starts in the 60s and 70s. It flowers in the 90s, and the net result is this, the nosedive, the nosedive um, in what we think of each other, uh, in our, our rising hostility towards each other in the last 15 years. Now, I assure you, Democrats blame George W. Bush for the rising polarization. Republicans blame Barack Obama. But the truth is that there was a 10-car freight train of polarizing trends crashing down the tracks of our democracy, and neither man could have done anything to stop it. So these are graphs of, uh, of data on polarization. And this shows, um, this shows the House of Representatives and the Senate from the Founding Fathers to today. Now, let me zoom in on the modern era in the House, just to explain this to you. Uh, so this is based on the same data that I showed you before, the same kind of analysis. And what you see is if we go back, this is from the Eisenhower through the Carter administration. 
the right half, these are, this, is the conserv this is the more right-leaning party, which in modern times is the Republican Party. The, uh, the light red is the moderate Republicans. The medium red is the medium, you know, just a regular conservative. So these are, these are uh, centrists, conservatives, and extreme conservatives. And dark, you, there's just a little bit of dark red here. So if you go back in that age, um, this is the midline. There were, there were, um, there were, um, cons there were liberal Republicans, and then there were also this red line here. These are conservative Democrats because the midline separates the chamber by party. So there used to be crossovers um, in both parties. And also note that the Republicans were overwhelmingly moderates or centrists. There were almost no extreme, there were no far right Republicans back in Eisenhower's day, or just a couple. But now watch what happens once we get past, remember 1980 is the critical turning point. Now look, look at the slope here. These are the moderate Republicans. They go to extinction by the time Obama enters office. They're gone. And this little bit of dark red here, uh, when Reagan came into office, becomes the large majority. The large majority of Republicans are now far right. On the Democratic side, there's been a slight move that way, but it's slight. So there, is, there are fewer centrists than there used to be, but it's not, nowhere near what happened there. It is now the case that the great majority of Republicans are what you would call far right, um, <clears throat> so, and they are ideologically passionate. Um, the Democrats were more mixed. The situation in the Senate is similar, but it's not, as, it's not as bad. The Senate is not as polarized. Second reason uh, is generational and cultural changes. So as, as was famously known, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan uh, could com compete fiercely during the day, but they would actually, they liked each other. They could have a drink at night. Um, we go from them. Now the key thing here is they remember World War II. Anybody who remembers World War II was shaped by it. And people came together to fight a foreign evil. Uh, when they went on to public life later, they could trust each other. They could work for the good of the country. We go to the first baby boomer president and the, first, uh, and the baby boomer uh, speaker, and they didn't like each other. But there was enough goodwill in Washington in the 90s. There were enough older uh, politicians who had friendships that Washington could still work. And this is where we are now. They don't like each other. They don't know each other. The social ties have frayed. Um, I'll, well, actually, this one's important, and this is the last one I'll do. Um, major changes in Washington in 1995 when Gingrich comes in. Uh, the Democrats had shut the Republicans out for a long time. And when Gingrich finally uh, brought the Republicans to victory, they wanted a more ideological uh, uh, house that would not, where the Republicans who were coming in would not be co-opted and become mushy centrists. So he makes a lot of changes. Um, committee chairmen now are not appointed by seniority, where they could even be liberal. They're now appointed by him, by the leadership, so that he can reward uh, those who are loyal to him and are extremely conservative. Um, a most important change he makes, I think, was he changed the calendar. It used to be that, wa that congressmen and senators actually lived in Washington, which meant that their spouses had all sorts of activities together, and their kids went to school together. They were at parties together. Gingrich said, no more of this, no more fraternizing with the enemy. He changed the calendar so that now all business is done from Tuesday afternoon through Thursday morning, just about. So nobody needs to live in Washington. You fly in Monday night. You fly out Thursday evening. And he said, don't get a house here. Don't move your family here. So since Gingrich, since, since that time, um, it, very few of them live there anymore. They, they rent a place with other members of their party. They, they do battle for two and a half days a week, and they go back to their district where they speak with people on their side. So uh, there's been a complete change in the social order of Washington. Imagine this incredibly complicated machinery that the Founding Fathers gave us with like two steering wheels and two brake pedals and you know, two houses and two parties. It's so complicated. And it, somehow it worked for, for almost 200 years, for 200 years. Well, it failed a couple times. It works for a long time because there's the motor oil of friendships and human relationships. That's what politicians are great at. They're generally very warm people with very good personal skills. So you take this really complicated machine and you open the plug and you say, no more motor oil, no more lubricant, no more personal relationships. All the oil drains out, the machine seizes up. And that's where we are.